Good morning. How is everybody today? Thank you for being here at PodCamp. Um, my name is Patty Swisher. Um, I am the Vice President of Corporate Communications for IKM Architects, which is a 100 plus year old firm in Pittsburgh. I am also an adjunct professor here at Point Park University, where I teach what I call Social Media 101. Uh, it's usually a dual registered class for graduates and undergraduates. Um, and we talk about social media for business. Uh, it is in the School of Communication. This is my third or fourth year speaking at PodCamp. Um, and I have found the community to be great. I'm so glad you're here to join us. Um, my true passion really is marketing. I have done marketing for the architecture firm for nearly 20 years. And so today we're going to talk about content marketing, building the bridge to success. And I'm excited because I have a co-presenter with me today. His name is Andrew Opolinski, and he is with Desmone Architects. I'll let him do his introduction when he comes up. Um, our plan, our schedule for the day is I'll do the first half, and then he'll do the second half, and then we'll come together to answer any of your questions. So we are here at PodCamp, right? So you either have a blog or a podcast, um, and you know what you want to talk about, but now you've got to tell people about it. You've got to figure out how to build that audience. So that's some of the things that we're going to talk about today. But first, what is content marketing, right? Content marketing is your approach on creating and distribu distributing your material to your audience. You want them to take a particular action. Content marketing happens where your main idea and what your audience wants comes together. So your main idea is your brand purpose. It's the reason that you're writing your blog. It's the reason that you're doing your podcast. That's your brand purpose. And then what your audience or what your customers want, that's why they're listening to you. That's why they're coming to your site. So where those two things come together, that's the sweet spot. So as I said, we're going to talk about the four steps to content marketing. Um, I'm going to talk about the first two, setting objectives and uh, defining your buyer's um, personas or audience needs um, in the architecture industry, which is a, where we'll dr draw a lot of our experience from. Um, we talk about our clients or our buyers. Um, but if you have a podcast or if you have a blog in particular, then you probably have more of an audience than a particular buyer. Unless, of course, you are trying to monetize and you are trying to sell a service or a product, then you too would have a buyer. And then, as I mentioned, Andrew will come up and talk about planning, execution, and amplification of your um, site. And then also some simple, we'll get into the basics of measurement and metrics. We're not going to talk heavy SEO, or we're not going to talk heavy metrics and numbers, um, but really about the things that you're looking for when you get into metrics for your sites. So first, uh, setting content strategy objectives, right? Uh, if you don't know what you want to achieve, then how will you know when you get there? The, the best way to know that is to have a particular objective. You can do that by creating a content marketing mission. Um, and so essentially that would be you know, what it is you want to achieve with your uh, particular site. So if you want to become a destination for a particular audience, they were talking about uh, the She podcast up here earlier. They were talking about the Wrestling Mayhem podcast. Um, so they have a very specific audience that they're trying to target. And they are interested in a very particular topic. So by defining those, by clearly stating them and actually writing them down per, perhaps on a piece of paper, you can um, really focus your objectives for your podcast or your blog. And then what do you want them to draw from it? You know, they all mentioned in the panel earlier in this room about the value. How do you create value for your audience? What is it that they really want or need to know from you? And that's the value that you deliver. And then that will help you to reach your marketing goals. You want to sell more t-shirts. You want to um, raise awareness about uh, women's issues. You want to talk about wrestling, right? Those become your, your goals. 
And one of the best ways to um, measure those goals is to talk about these specific areas, brand awareness, right? If you can't come up with one um, particular goal, brand awareness is always your goal. If more people know you tomorrow after you've done your podcast than know you today, then you've raised brand awareness. If you want to generate sales, that would be lead generation or at least leads to sales. You know, people that are prospects that might buy your particular um, service or product. If you want to have engagement, if you're looking for having a conversation with like-minded individuals, then engagement might be your particular goal. And how do you raise engagement? How do you improve your audience to a degree where you're satisfied with a level of engagement or to continually improve that engagement, right? What steps can you take to do that? Of course, sales. You know, they, um, we had the comedian up on the panel in this room before. I don't know how many of you were in here. Um, but he wants to make money, right? That was his primary goal. So, and that's not a bad goal, but he knows it. And so how's he going to do that? Um, so by defining his particular audience and the people that are looking for what he has to offer, then he can target those people better uh, and help him to reach his goal. And then, of course, there's lead nurturing, customer retention or loyalty, um, customer evangelism. You know, once you have those true believers for your audience, those people can help you promote your product or service. So that would be the evangelism. And then to upsell or cross-sell your products. Maybe your podcast is a side job of something else that you're really interested in selling. So that would be upselling or cross-selling. So we, you know, we talk about content marketing. And because we're at PodCamp, we talk about podcasts. And blogs are certainly a subset of that. But what other type of content can you use in your content marketing plan? So I grabbed this graphic from Curata. And I think it's um, a, a pretty telling graphic because it talks about low effort versus high effort and the amount of reach that you'll have as it relates to those. So whenever you're just curating content, and you all know what that means, right? When you're collecting other people's content on social media, when other people's blog posts, other people's um, podcasts, and you're sharing those because you have uh, the similar interest to those and you are attracting an audience that's similar to that, that's pretty much curating content. You're not doing a lot to develop that. You're not investing a lot of time, effort, um, to actually create new content. You're really just sharing it because you thought, hey, this was interesting to me, and I think it will be interesting to my audience too. So that's really at the base of the pyramid here. And then, of course, you can get into short-form blog posts or contributed content. That might be where you write the, you know, the quick blog posts, the tweets that you share every day, um, the contributed content where you might write for somebody else's um, site or be a guest on their uh, show, that would be in the next level. And then you get into where it requires a little bit more effort on your part, where you get into infographics and slide shares. So we've developed this slide presentation for you today, and this might be something that we post on our professional LinkedIn pages through SlideShare. So this presents us and to our audience as marketing professionals. But it takes some time and effort to come up with your um, slide presentation or your, to develop your infographic, to collect the data and then to present it in a, uh, an attractive way. And then, of course, you get into blog posts and presentations or podcasts. Those would be the things that you know, you're developing daily, weekly, monthly, um, where you do spend a lot of time in production. Um, and it takes a lot more effort. And then. You can, if you even go even higher than that, you can get into the thought leadership where you are writing ebooks and white papers, and then ultimately books. I think uh, Dave, the opening keynote, talked about writing a book. And we've had other speakers at PodCamp before that have written books as well. So you can imagine the amount of effort that's required for that. But all of that is considered content that can be directed towards your audience. And those are things that you can actually um, share with your audience as part of your strategy. So who is this audience? How do you define this audience, right? What does the audience need? The, how many of you have heard the term buyer persona? 
Have you heard the term buyer persona? Yeah, it's not really new right now, but it's really the generic term to define the audience that you're trying to attract. So we talk about buyer personas, particularly as it helps us to focus our efforts related to uh, what it is we're trying to share. Again, AKA your audience. So how do you define your buyer personas? What are the key ideas that you can use to shape how you define your particular audience? You know, the She podcasts, they were very particular about having a closed group of women only for their Facebook group. But yet on Twitter, they would attract um, both male and female members of their audience and people that were interested in the topics that they had to share. So that would generally be demographic characteristics, right? So whether they're male or female, single or married, um, what age they are, you know, if you're um, selling t-shirts to a young teen crowd, Instagram and Snapchat are going to be the place where you're going to promote your product. But if you're attracting the uh, 45 to 65 year old male, I don't think they're going to be on Snapchat so much. So uh, defining your uh, audience in terms of demographics really helps you decide um, what areas you want to get into um, as far as where you want to promote your content. And then of course, you can get into psychographics or you can define them by market, right? Are they interested in healthcare? Are they interested in fitness? Are they interested in banking? You know, if you think about the, the concepts that your audience would be interested in, that will help you, again, to target your messages to a particular area. Geography. If you're a local coffee shop, right, what is the geography of the audience that you're trying to attract? Your podcast might reach worldwide, but is that really the geography of the audience that you are trying to get to come to your pot, uh, coffee shop to increase your sales? So thinking about all of these things really helps to define those particular buyers um, or audience that you would want for your sites. In some ways, it's very common sense, but in other ways, when you don't think about it that way, you can kind of be all over the map. And that kind of waters down your effectiveness. So when we talk about buyer personas, we talk about um, taking them through a cycle. Uh, and often we call it a sales cycle. And most often, um, I think we'll talk about uh, the sales funnel as we move along a little further. Um, but you can move them from being a complete stranger to your audience all the way to being a promoter of your audience. Uh, this graphic is from HubSpot and, you know, the different things that you share and how you share them in order to get them to move from one stage of the cycle to the next. So your blog, you can use keywords and social media to promote your blog to complete strangers. By using a particular hashtag, you can reach a, an audience that you might not otherwise reach. And that might make them become visitors. They might be frequent visitors to your site where they come maybe once and they think, oh, I might come back to this. But by sharing information via Twitter or um, attracting them to your site with your uh, Facebook page, you can then convert them into regular visitors where they start to become a more regular audience. Using things like calls to action, um, asking them to complete forms where you can obtain their contact information, um, that helps move them to the next phase where they become an actual lead, right? Where they might be somebody that would buy your products. And that way you can have more targeted direct email to them. Ultimately, they become a customer. You want them to become a customer, right? So by sharing things over time through this cycle, you can help move someone from being a complete stranger to a customer or audience member um, to then an actual promoter or an evangelist for your particular project. And for those people you want to share, um, up here they call it smart content, but you want to give them some, some, something, something special, right? You want them to feel special. You want to uh, increase that brand loyalty. Give them exclusive content. So this slide, this is a, here's a slide with a lot of words, right? <laughs> what do audience personas development determine? What kind of content to create, which is essentially what I have been talking about. So if you're trying to attract a particular audience, what kind of content do you create to attract them? 
Um, what is the tone and style of that content? Again, if you're talking to somebody about fitness versus talking to somebody about banking, your tone is going to be completely different. Say you're a professional financial advisor and you're trying to attract people that you want to manage their money. You're not going to talk to them the same way a beer podcast talks to someone as does someone who is talking about fitness or cycling, right? Your tone is going to be very different. What topics should you, you focus on? Um, you start your podcast or your blog because you have a passion or an interest in a particular topic. It's best if you outline, and we're not talking about it here today, but a calendar of what topics you'll cover. You have to have an idea in your mind of the things that you really want to share with people and how you're going to manage that over the course of time, right? So it, you, if you don't have enough content to do, to do a daily blog, right, then you really shouldn't plan for a daily blog. Maybe it's weekly. Maybe it's biweekly. Thinking about that calendar and how you'll create uh, topics to fill in that calendar that are of interest to your audience, pre-planning and creating that strategy for that is really going to help you to be more successful in the long run. And this will help you in, in how your content strategy will evolve, right? You might be very eager in the beginning uh, to jump in and, you know, really get going as far as um, your content strategy and promoting your blog or your podcast. But really taking a step back and taking time to create a plan will help you to stay focused and keep going when you get stuck. So this is just some, one of the um, graphics that we use for talking about buyer personas and how you might have different personas um, even within the audience that you have. Um, you know, the, the 45 to 65 year old male in his suit and tie that talks about banking, right? Might that be one of your target audiences? Or uh, the working mom? Do you, are you interested in attracting the working mom and what issues are important to her? They're certainly going to be completely different than the, than the working dad, we'll say. Uh, and then there might be multiple entities, as, as I have said a couple times, right? You can have more than one particular target audience, um, but by defining them, it helps you to define your key messages so that you can target your content towards them. And again, you're trying to match what it is you want to share with what it is that they want. They want something, they want to know something from you. They're going to come back because they find your information valuable. So educate them, inform them. And of course, like the comedian, entertain them, right? If it's not entertaining in some way, you're not going to spend your time there. We all know how many times we click on that video and in the first two seconds we click off of it again because it just didn't capture our attention. So that's really what you're after. And then also, the, the second point is very important. Um, it, we're certainly not oblivious to the amount of content we consume on our mobile devices. So you need to consider where your audience will consume your information. Whether it's on mobile, it's on desktop, what time of day it will be? Is it on a tablet? How will they consume the information? And how you create and share that information will certainly impact what your audience's key preferences are. And then, of course, selling your solutions to internal stakeholders. This would be more if you're part of an organization or a group where you have to generate buy-in from multiple people in your organization. Um, by defining what your audience wants and needs, you can then begin to generate that buy-in with multiple stakeholders in your audience. This is one form of the um, funnel, the sales funnel, and talks about the stages in the buying cycle. But if you take one thing away from this, I think it's really all of this text over here that you take away. Because again, it talks just like we talked about the content, the types of content that you can develop. It talks about the things that you can share at a particular level. And this pretty much inverts it because really you're going from a broad audience down to a more narrow audience with the more specific things that you talk about and uh, share with your audience. But you know, where it's blog articles, infographics, and videos down to 
events and workshops, um, customer-only events and loyalty programs. So the more narrow you get with your audience, the more specific content and the more, I don't want to say private content, but the more special content that you want to share with those very loyal um, members of your audience. So that's pretty much the first two steps. I'm going to turn it over to Andrew. I'm going to let him introduce himself and then also continue on with the presentation. Thank you, Patty. Very well said. Uh, my name is Andrew Opolinski. Just a little bit of house cleaning. I am the Director of Marketing and Communications for Desmo and Architects. Um, we're a similar firm to IKM. We're about 40 people. They're right around 50. Uh, both firms are kind of progressive in the way that they do uh, marketing and digital marketing. And therefore, uh, I found it beneficial for me to uh, go and get the HubSpot certifications in both inbound and digital. So that's kind of what landed me here today. So um, kind of keeping things cruising, uh, section three is in regards to planning, execution, and amplification. So uh, what type of planning tactics are we going to use? What type of uh, vehicles are we going to execute with? Uh, what type of mediums are we going to use? And then how are we going to amplify those mediums? So just to get started, uh, this first slide talks about just utilizing your market position. Uh, so everyone has their own unique position. Obviously, um, us as an architecture firm, we kind of know where we stand in the marketplace. And the same thing kind of goes with the, uh, the podcasters. Now, you have a specific audience. You have a specific topic. And once you kind of have that defined, you can uh, narrow, down, narrow down your different topics to uh, various issues. So content marketing is all about addressing uh, a problem or, or, or an issue or, or, or something of interest that your people are going to want to or your audience is going to want to consume. Um, so you can kind of uh, take it from the top down and consider your position, uh, then consider your issues, and then kind of create topics out of those different issues, uh, topics on how to solve a problem that your audience is interested in listening to you about. Uh, Patty mentioned these just a little bit ago. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, useful resources for planning, uh, different types of templates. HubSpot has tons of them on their website. Um, I frequently use the top one just to kind of... Uh, give me a focus for, uh, or a roadmap for how my year is going to go. And this is broken up into different dates, but ours are actually broken up into uh, different months. So we'll, uh, each month at Desmoon, we'll release a, a specific blog, say, um, this month we're targeting hospitality clients. We're getting ready to design a new boutique hotel in Lawrenceville. So we want to get some content going on about boutique hotels and our um, expertise in that market. So therefore, I can kind of give myself an idea of, of what's coming up. I can place an, an offer or a call to action there. And it kind of just gives me an overview of what we're going to be talking about uh, that month. And then down below is just kind of a more uh, um, simpler way to do stuff uh, with the Google Docs or Google templates, anything like that. Um, really anything where you can kind of see what's coming up. It just gives you kind of a way to, to plan and execute a little bit more effectively. So this is kind of a live example. And this is uh, a few months ago we did this. Recently, uh, our office opened up a new branch in Morgantown, uh, so we kind of just wanted to get in there and um, start talking to our audience in Morgantown, uh, start getting a feel for the different market segments down there where we could maybe design a couple different projects. So this is an example of a, cr uh, a creative brief that we actually put together, and this is kind of how I go about um, launching different types of pieces of content. And you can kind of see uh, I'll define the topic. I'll define the audience, uh, you know, who should care about this topic. And really, this is, a, this is a pretty simple piece of content. The idea here was just to uh, launch it on our blog and then kind of streamline it across all of our social media, email blasts, so it's all kind of consistent. Um, so you can kind of see that's the, that's the goal here. And I plug in, you know, desired outcomes. We want to increase newsletter subscriptions. So that's our, that's our call to action with this piece of content. Pretty simple. Um, but it's still great to have because we can refer back to it and uh, kind of see what uh, our different goals were. So this one was called Why We're Mad About Morgantown. And you can kind of see uh, how we laid the brief out and kind of structure the content. So for execution and amplification, um, so how do you spread the word? Uh, how do you get your message out there? Obviously, uh, a lot of different presenters today and tomorrow are going to be talking about podcasting, so that'll be their, uh, their vehicle, their medium to get the word out. But uh, when it comes to content, there's tons of different ways that you can get your content out. Um, email blasts, newsletters, your website, homepage, blog, news, or a mixture of all those, uh, webinars, organic social media posts, programmatic marketing, which is, gets more into ad buying, and uh, some high-level targeting with, with, with big data. 
uh, digital advertising, on-page and off-page SEO, which we're not going to touch on a whole lot here, but it's definitely critical for your uh, content marketing efforts. So people are finding your content when they're searching for you in Google. Um, employee social media, customer social media, uh, various display ads, whether it's something, you know, if you, if you have a topic coming up on your, on your podcast, like Patty said about wrestling, and you want to get some ads out about wrestling, you can do that. Um, paid social, guest posts, or even having other people share your content. Influencers share your content. That's always crucial for us. If a, if a client shares a piece of content that we post and other clients see that, it kind of just creates rapport for us in the marketplace. Um, paid media and earned media. Uh, earned media is just maybe a, um, uh, a new news article about a recent project that you've done or a news article about your, uh, your podcast. And offline ads as well. So, so print and all the different things that you can do offline from a marketing standpoint. So Patty mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, understanding the client journey is pretty crucial. And this is a, a great visual from Hinge Marketing, which is one of my favorite resources. And it kind of just walks you through the stages of the funnel. And in essence, it's broken down into three stages. Uh, you can attract prospects through things like blog posts, uh, guest content, SEO. Stage two kind of is more about building engagement, um, growing your reputation. You can do things like um, speaking engagements, uh, books, webinars, uh, identify potential new clients, and these kind of just have more substance. So you're kind of moving down, you're kind of narrowing your focus, and obviously with your end game, wanting to grow your client base or your audience base for podcasts, uh, turning opportunities into clients. Um, and this just says phone consultations and demos, personal interactions confirm that you'll have a solution to a client's problem. So as you kind of move down this this funnel here, um, your content will then have a little bit more substance when you're presenting it. Uh, repurposing is always a, a topic that I like to bring up. This is also a, another hinge marketing graphic. And this is just an example of how you can repurpose your content. Um, and this is a perfect example because today we're doing a speaking engagement. So if someone else is going to present later on and they want to repurpose this, they don't just have to uh, stop at their speaking engagement. They can do things like putting it on the blog putting it on your video, uh, your video blog, slide share on LinkedIn, articles that expand on the presentation topics, blog posts with key points or, or social media. So there's tons of ways that you can repurpose your content. And I think I actually have a second example here as well. Uh, say that I'm doing a study in a white paper and I get it out there and I put it on my website. I don't just want to end there. Um, there's all kinds of different ways that I can also repurpose a piece of content like that that will be valuable to other people who may have not seen it the first round to go. Um, so therefore, I could turn a study or a white paper into an article, uh, multiple blog posts, social media, slide share again, a webinar or a podcast, or multiple speaking topics. So you can kind of see, um, I often see in the marketplace when I meet different marketers in our, in our arena at least, that they, they'll create a piece of content and then they'll kind of stop there and they'll kind of let it fall off and they'll start thinking about, or, or even getting stressed out about, uh, what can I do next? What should I do next? What kind of topic can I talk about next month? But really, if you get into repurposing, there's all kinds of stuff that you can do and you can, it'll give you a, a kind of a clearer path for the month to get your content out there. So this is the live example that we saw a little bit ago and uh, this was one that we did at Desmond, like I said, just a few months ago when we launched our brand's office in Morgantown. And uh, this is all based off the creative brief that I showed you a little bit ago and you can kind of see where this started. So the original post was, was on our website, within our blog. And then you can kind of see how we walked through repurposing it. Um, you can see that it went to Twitter, it went to Facebook, it went to LinkedIn, it went to Google+, and it also went to our, our newsletter there. And, and everything's streamlined and everything's consistent, but the audience that saw this might be a different audience that saw these. So we're kind of tapping into all of our different, all of our different networks by doing content repurposing. So four is uh, measurement and metrics, and, and, and like we talked about, we're not going to get uh, too in the weeds with measurement and metrics. There's a lot of stuff that you can talk about when it comes to SEO, when it comes to Google Analytics, but we'll, we'll kind of just talk about a few of the basics when it comes to measurement and metrics. So the four types of content metrics are what you see here. And uh, maybe most of you might look at this chart and say, well, I'm just most interested in sales metrics. Most of us are, but in order to get those sales metrics, you have to have your lead generation metrics. You have to have your sharing metrics. 
and you also have your you have to have your consumption metrics. So they kind of they kind of stack up and, and lead into the sales. So as you're moving your your customer or your buyer along that journey, then you're also measuring your metrics based on these four quadrants. So consum consumption metrics consist of uh, page views, video views, uh, downloads, social chatter, basically anyone kind of talking about your brand online. Uh, they help you measure brand awareness and your website traffic. Uh, basically, anytime your content can be consumed, it's considered a consumption metric. Sharing metrics are, uh, go a little bit farther. So instead of that person just consuming your information or consuming something that you may have posted on social media, they can share it, and you can measure it that way. So if, if you use uh, Facebook or Twitter, you can measure your, your shares or your retweets or, or your plus ones if you use Google+, Plus, which I don't always advise to use. It's basically just good for SEO. Uh, or pins if you use Pinterest, really based on wherever your audience is, is using social media. Um, for, it, it, there's a bullet point there for forwards just saying um, if you use something like MailChimp or some sort of uh, email marketing platform, you can track all that different kind of stuff. And uh, one thing that's really notable is we use MailChimp at Desmoan, and I love it because every time I send out an email blast, I can go in and I can see which of my contacts on my email list opened our, opened our, our email blast that month the most. And we can see uh, who clicked on what the most. And what's great about all those platforms is you can kind of measure um, what your audience is doing with your, with your e-blast instead of just saying, okay, I sent this out to 5,000 people and 2,500 people opened it. 50% open rate, that's really good, but I want to take it a step farther. Um, so those are some, some sharing metrics that you can kind of measure. Uh, lead gen metrics uh, get a little bit more substance. Uh, how often does content consumption result in a lead? Uh, so how, it helps you measure lead generation, lead nurturing, and engagement. Um, form completions, like we talked about a little bit, a little bit ago. Uh, it's a huge HubSpot thing. Um, a lot of high growth firms in our, in our arena, in other companies as well, they are using websites that you can go to and you can take action on something. So you're not just looking at a static website, you're not just reading about information, they're offering you maybe like a form to download that might be relevant to you, or a newsletter subscription that may be relevant. And in return, they're capturing that lead. You, 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 you return into a, a cold or hot lead for them. Uh, email subscriptions, blog subscriptions, blog comments, these are all different types of lead generation metrics that you're probably seeing on the web today. And finally, our sales metrics, which are the utmost important, definitely, but you can't, like I said, you can't have sales metrics without the other three types of, of measurement. Um, so do we actually make any money because of this content? How do you measure customer acquisition and sales goals? Uh, so you can measure online sales, you can measure offline sales, uh, you can use Google Analytics to do so. And there's all kinds of ways to use Google Analytics to kind of set up a specific call to action or a uh, track a buyer's journey, whether it's somebody who's checking out at your website uh, and purchasing something, or it's just somebody that's downloading a form, um, you can kind of see where that source came from. Uh, did that source come from Google, and what keywords were they searching for? Or did that source come from Facebook or Twitter, and how did they come through there? Did they come through a certain post? So you can kind of use that to kind of measure and track where your audience is coming from. So then in return, once you start launching your next campaigns or your campaigns in the future, um, you, you know who to target, and it, it, it kind of saves you money and saves time as well. So in summary, um, we talked about the four steps to a content strategy. Um, there's a lot of other things that, that these four topics cover, but that's kind of a broad overview without kind of getting uh, uh, lost or confused in terms of uh, how content marketing can be effective for you and your business. Um, we talked about setting objectives. We talked about defining buyers, uh, buyer personas, and audience needs. Uh, we talked about planning, execution, and a little bit of amplification. And we talked about measurement and metrics. So with that, does anyone have any questions that we can address? Over your head. Good, bad. Make sense? Does it all make sense? Like I said, some of it is common sense, but at the same time, if you take the step back and actually take the time to create a content strategy, it will help you achieve your objectives better. Any questions? All right, thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks so much.